right, we've got a lot to cover today. Got a lot to cover today. So, uh, did the outlines a little different this morning. And the whole idea of this, you don't have to use it if you don't want to, but the whole deal behind this is just to give you some handles on, on uh, what we're trying to walk through. And uh, so you're going to have the first page, which is uh, going to be, uh, you can still fold it and all that, put it in your Bible, you know. You can kind of open it as a book. If it's messed up, Ellen did it. So I, you know, you just mess with her, you yell at her. Which means it's probably perfect, <laughs> since Ellen did it. I didn't do it. While you're getting your outlines, let me uh, just give us a really quick um, brief update of where we were yesterday. And we spent a lot of time, I understand, on some kind of preliminary things, but it was extremely necessary. We talked about, um, number one, obviously the whole focus was on prophecy. And we haven't heard a lot about it. Learned that it's a controversial It's a controversial topic, but that there's a responsibility that we have. Just because it's controversial doesn't mean we run from it, okay? It's in the Word, and we have to take a stance on that. And our stance has got to be concrete. And what we mean by concrete is we're coming back to the Word to understand prophecy. What does the Bible say about it, okay? How do we approach it, Okay. We, we're gonna, we, we can only, and that means, and we didn't get some of this, this this yesterday morning, but that means that there are some things about prophecy that you just can't answer. There, there, are, there are some questions that you are not allowed to ask because the Bible does not ask them, okay? You can't, you can't make assumptions about things because we just don't have any information on that. So we can only deal with prophecy within the confines of the Word. That's really significant because I think when you begin to stray outside of the confines of the word, you're going to get in trouble. You're going to start hanging billboards, <laughs> okay? And that's bad, okay? That's bad, you know? So we're going to have a concrete approach on prophecy, which is the word, which is going to lead us into a Christian perspective. And uh, ended yesterday talking about the Christian perspective uh, in regards to relationship, okay? Uh, I believe Christianity is 100% relationship, period. I'm, I'm, ap I'm absolutely convinced that what it means to be Christian is to walk in intimacy, love, and relationship with Him every day. That's what makes me a Christian, okay? Sin is seen in my, in my framework from in relationship, Obedience is seen in terms of that intimate relationship. Um, overcoming happens in relationship. Having a holy life is relationship. My marriage being successful happens in the confines of our relationship. His, our relationship, me and Jesus. So Christianity is thoroughly about relationship. Now what I want to cover with you uh, today as quickly and as efficiently as thoroughly as possible, is really what is prophet, the whole concept of prophecy, beginning to d d uh, dive into that. And um, the first point of that is going to be, so this is going to be a new one, we'll just call it four, I guess. The necessity. The necessity of prophecy. That prophecy was demanded, Okay? Prophecy is demanded in the Word. Genesis chapter 1. I want to look with you at the first point there is God's creation. And uh, over uh, the last couple years, um, it, it just has, has turned out as we begin to study uh, Revelations, I begin to walk through this, I found myself consistently dragged back to Genesis where it all began. Because Revelation and Genesis are consistently tied together. What God is restoring is what He began. What he began. Okay, we're going we're to continue on where we left off kind of stuff. There's been this intermediate kind of period. And so you come back and you look at God's creation. And uh, the verses there, Genesis 1, chapter 1, verses 1 through 31, is the initial 
uh, seven days of creation into, I guess it would be uh, chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. But you have this whole creation uh, scene. And uh, one of the things I found really significant is that uh, creation is referred to as good seven times. Okay? Creation is referred to as good seven times. In his, I mean, there's only like, what, seven days? You know, the day is great. Okay? God creates, and when, in his creation process, he sets back and says, wow, I really like this. Okay? And the fabric, the whole crux of all the creation, again, it hinges on this intimacy of creation with the Creator. Let me give you an example in particular. When God creates man, verse 26, really important. When God creates man, he says, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness. All of my Christian experience up until... Uh, just a few years ago, I had understood being created in the image, uh, image of God to be physical. That we physically, and there, I guess there is some kind of, there is some kind of evidence, and I'm even questioning in regards to the image idea about Jesus before the foundation of the, of the world, God creating us in his image. That humanity already had kind of a sketch in terms of who Jesus was going to be. And there's a possibility that I'm exploring that in my own personal walk and don't really have too much to say about it at this point because I'm not sure. I changed my mind. But when we're talking about created in this image, the emphasis in the passage seems strong on relationship. That mankind was created. We, he created mankind in his image. Angels were not created in his image. Lions, tigers, and bears were not created in his image. Okay? Apes were not created in his image. That is thoroughly a human thing. See, what makes a human being a human being is not DNA. What makes a human being a human being is the image of God thing. Now, that's, that's, that ended the evolution debate for me. Are apes created, you know, or do we come from apes? No. But in fact, one guy at Olivet, and I shared this years ago, when I was there, uh, Chad and I worked with him in the youth group, his boys. The guy's a, he was a genius, smart. He had studied this certain line of apes. New York Times interviewed him, and he almost got fired. He may have gotten fired from the college. It was this big stink in the Church of the Nazarene. But he had found this certain strand of apes. I don't know if you ever heard of this before, but he found a certain strand of apes whose DNA was closer to our DNA than its own cousins. Of course, meaning that it was just evolution was one step away. Now, it's a big step, okay? I mean, because you have apes and humans, okay? Although, you know, we have looked at people in the past and thought, <laughs> okay, but, okay, whatever you want to do with the DNA, whatever you want to do with the, the DNA, apes, animals were not created in the image of God. They do not have a capacity. They do not have the capacity of intimacy with him that we do. Okay? So when God, this is all founded on relationship. That all of the creation, and we're going to explain some of this when we get down, because we're going to need to wait toward to the communication section for some of this. But when God says it's good, he's not talking about quality, though quality, everything God makes is good. We talk about heaven, it seems like oftentimes we want to talk about physical quality. We want to talk about streets of gold. I'm talking about mansions. I'm talking about new bodies, that kind of stuff. And there's things to be said about that. We're all going to have great bodies, okay? It's going to be great places to live. It's going to be a world without sin. It's going to be, it's going to be wonderful. But the goodness that he seems to talk about, and this word good, if you take it into the Greek and then drag it into the New Testament, you're going to find that the word good is a relational quality as well. Okay? It's not oftentimes used to describe just physical things. It's a relational element to it. So when God has creation, he is an intimate, you got to get this, he is an intimate, perfect oneness intimacy with his creation. Okay? The whole thing revolves in intimacy with him. All of man's actions that are listed from verse 26 all the way down through verse 31 is intimately connected to him. He tends and he cares for the animals. You're going to learn about that in chapter 2. He, that's not a job description. It's the, natural, it's the natural flowing of the heavenly father in the life of Adam 
that enables him to connect with creation. You take God out of all of that and the whole thing goes awry. You say, how do you know that? The problem of sin. Your next little point there. But you get into chapter three. There's a problem that happened in chapter three. There's a whole glitch in the system. Okay, the glitch in the system, and I put through the second one, is beyond the physical. Corey really expounded on this last night for us. I thought he did just a beautiful job at it. Just God used him last night. The problem of sin is not a physical problem. One of the things that, uh, and I've not shared this until recently, um, but it's very true. It's not made up. Never re read the Bible before 1995. I mean, I'd heard stories. I grew up in Indiana, so everyone was religious in Indiana, even the drug dealers. Say everybody was religious. Everybody knew about God. Everybody went to church or knew someone who went to church. This is how it was. But I'd never really studied or read a lot of the Bible. And um, a lot of my initial observations in 1995 of reading the Word was, it was just, uh, it was almost like it was a joke. It was so simplistic. Um, the, I've learned more now, but even then there was a biblical time frame that I didn't know the exact details of. Now we know that the biblical time frame since Adam's sin is somewhere around 7,000 years, okay, since we've lived in sin, okay, since Adam plunged the whole human race to sin, got about 7,000 years. And the Bible, from my initial observation, the Bible seemed to present this whole time period of sin of just catastrophe of of just the worst kind of news you've heard. I mean, the horrific examples of sin. All of that is because a man ate an apple. Okay? That was my initial observation. Okay? Because I've seen it in the physical. That all of God's initial creation, which wasn't supposed to be like this, all of that happened because Adam and Eve ate an apple, which I thought was ridiculous. Okay? Seriously, that was my initial observation. I remember thinking, that was this ridiculous. God is, that he is just flies off the handle, okay? It's like my mother-in-law. I mean, it's ridiculous, okay? I mean, sir, the overreaction of that whole thing, okay? There had to be some other, and again, Corey said it beautifully, there had to be some kind of physical remedy that he could have done, okay? Whatever the punishment in their culture, the physical punishment was severe, caught stealing, whatever, cut off the hand, okay? Time out, day is like a thousand years, Okay? I mean, you could have done something. But if the sin was not, and this is just not, not too much going into the word studies. This is just a logical conclusion of deducing that if it was a physical problem, you could take, you could take care of it with a physical answer. But see, if it wasn't a, if there's no physical answer offered, then there must be a spiritual problem that took place. And the physical was just a representation. It was just a manifestation. It was just the showing of the, of the spiritual problem. So the glitch that we're finding in the scriptures, okay, and I'm telling you all this for a purpose, we're moving in a direction, okay, the necessity of prophecy is that God created the world to be intimately involved, connected. There's this intimacy with God and man, okay? Problem happens, sin, not physical, not a physical detraction, not a physical problem, but there was a spiritual problem, and I mentioned this yesterday, and I'm going to mention it again today. I'm not redefining sin, but I'm re-looking at sin in a couple different ways. It seems like independence is a good word at times to talk about sin. Man, man, see, when Satan came to Adam, he didn't say, hate God. He didn't say, serve me. He didn't, none of that stuff. It's just think independently from him. This is how God sees the garden. This is how God sees the tree. This is God's plan. Just expand your mind. Don't be so narrow. What if you viewed it like this? Have a thought of your own, Adam. Come on. You're, just, you're a tool. That was what sin was. He sought to be separate. And the cat, it was catastrophic. It was catastrophic. And the physical world that we knew it just spun out of balance. Which, again, there's all kinds of things you could talk about that. Perhaps the physical in your life is not physical at all. Perhaps it's spiritual. Okay? That the physical is just, I mean, I believe everything is spiritual. Everything is spiritual. There's nothing that's not spiritual. Now, this leads us, the consequences of sin, therefore... 
okay? Problem of sin beyond the physical, seek, uh, the seeking of independence. The consequence of sin is that creation was corrupted. Now, you learn about this uh, down, for instance, when he's given some of the details of Adam uh, to Adam in verse 17. And he says, Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you. And you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, for the dust you are, and to dust you will return. So literally, man's spiritual sin, this is remarkable. And again, you have to go back to chapter 1 and look at man's involvement in creation. This is real big. Um, <laughs> you shouldn't litter anyway. You shouldn't litter anyway, obviously. I've been under major conviction recently because of my wife. <laughs> stuff gets left in a car I just, oh that irritates me man that irritates me so I'm driving down the window and I'm looking over and there's wrappers and there's kids suckers that are stuck and I'm thinking Rich. I can't even throw it out the window because there's a stick in there you know, so I have to wrap it back up in the stuff and I stick it right there and it just piles up and it's just so oh, irritating I just love to litter. <laughs> I would love just people to chuck it out the window. Okay? Take your McDonald's and just right out the window. Okay? I just, but there's something inside of me recently that has surfaced in light of this study, honestly. Something inside of me that says, I am a steward. I mean, do you not know? You are a steward of the land. There's this idea that God is coming to take us away. No, he is not. You're going to stay. People that don't know him is going to go away eventually. There's a place prepared for them. There's going to be a new heaven, new earth come down. But God is not coming to just take people away. Hey, literally, you are here to bring that on heaven as it is in her. I mean, on earth as it is in heaven kind of stuff. So there's this some connection that I really would like to explore. I don't know if it's going to surface or not in Revelation, and I don't have time just for fun studies. But um, I would really like to find the connection between us and the earth. And I've wondered about stuff like earthquakes. I've wondered about if there's a spiritual, and I know that gets really mystical, but I've wondered about tornadoes. See, I've wondered about that kind of stuff. I wondered about the spiritual impact that I can make. I wondered about Isaiah standing up and saying, the spiritual movement of God was so strong in his day that he said, it's not going to rain. I mean, that kind of, what do you do with that? Well, you can do whatever we want with it. I'm not doing anything with it at the present. But you see that man's sin affected all of this. In other words, it was intimately connected with his person. That you realize how profound that is? That maybe you could, you literally could affect the environment of a place by living there. Take a person that lives in rebellion. I, I've got people from, from high school that I've looked, we're getting ready to go to their, I'm not going to my high school reunion. I decided not to go. But people that's lived this rough, hard, drinking, partying, excessive, sinful life, they're just wrinkly and old looking. Okay? And they just, they look years, that's, Sin wears on everything. I, I think there's something with that. Do I do? I think there's something about that. Okay, whatever you want to do with that. But you understand his sin corrupted. The whole earth just 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 rippled in light of his sin. Uh, vegetation, animals, we're gonna get into some of that here just in a little bit. But mankind. The major shift, not, and you can't say it's major, it is a major shift, but it's not the most major, happened that mankind, uh, the corruption, creation corrupted, examples, vegetation, and animals, mankind did not know the mind of God. And again, independence. That's why I'm coming back to this independence idea, that sin is much more than just a morally incorrect path that I've taken that teens you, if you could embrace this, it'll change your life. Sin is not the wrong thing. 
Sin is independence from him. Sin is a voluntarily, willfully rebellious, I'm doing it myself kind of a thing. I'm, this is my own, butt out kind of a deal. It's seeking independence. And in that independence, Adam and Eve did not know. They, they sensed something was different. They're hiding from God. You begin to under, you're under the impression that they wondered how he would feel. They never had to wonder about that before sin. Never. They're hiding from God. There was a, a separation there. In fact, God has to come to them, which is really profound. God has to come to them and tell them what he thinks. Now, I don't know if you want to call it telepathy. I don't know if you want to talk about superhero stuff. But there was this kind of such close intimacy between God and man that they knew each other. They lived in fellowship. Creation, all of creation just gelled in that sort of manner. Everyone lived in that kind of harmony. I know how he feels. Adam walked and cre treated creation and animals and the naming of the animals. All of that took place out of that intimate involvement of the Father. That's heaven, you understand. And the creation just, just absolutely rejoiced in that. And it's rejoicing to get back to that, the scriptures say. Okay? So what you have is the necessity of prophecy is in sin. Hear this. When sin happened... Prophecy was absolutely demanded to maintain that. Now, Dr. Manley and I talked about some of this. And we're going to get to some of the details of this here in just a few minutes, quickly. There was revelation. I'm not saying that there wasn't communication. But something changed in that communication in sin. And we call it prophecy. We call it prophecy. The next deal... Understanding the necessity of prophecy, number five, is the need for communication. Obviously, God greatly desires communication with us. One of the things that I found that was extremely significant as I began to study prophecy is one, before sin in the garden, there's no prophecy which we don't know a lot about. We know a little bit about Genesis 1. We know about a little bit from throughout the scriptures here and there. But before sin, there was no, we can't find any information that there was any prophecy. And after sin, we know all kinds of information, two or three chapters alone in Revelation and other places. After sin, there's no, there's no prophecy. We're going to know him. <laughs> We're going to seem like he is. I'm not saying that there's not growth. But there's no there's no prophecy. Before sin, there was no need for prophecy like we currently have it in this fallen world. No prophecy before or after sin. In fact, Genesis 3, 14 through 19 is the first prophecy, and it happens. It is demanded immediately after the first sin. So when we're talking about biblical prophecy, we're talking about something that was instituted by God and was demanded in order for communication with us. Upon sin, prophecy was born because God had to communicate to you. That is really important. Now there's some passages that I'm going to allude to that I found extremely significant. We're not putting them in our outline. God comes to Abraham, prophesies. We're going to talk about what prophecy is. In just two seconds, prophecy fulfills two needs for communication. But God has this great desire for communication. He has this great desire for humanity because you were created to know the mind of the Father, you guys. You're created to know the mind of the Father, not rules. It's you turn on the television and you end up turning it. Someone says, why? He wouldn't watch that. Now, he didn't consider that entertainment. One of the things I've been finding in recent days even the some of the stuff that probably I wouldn't want other people to see, I almost see it the way he sees it while seeing it. It's really confusing. <laughs> I don't know. I just, I tune things out. There's a, something an old guy told me that a long time ago that I thought was ridiculous. He said he turned, me. it might have been Stephen, though you're not the old guy that I was thinking of. I promise that's not what I meant. 
okay? You might have told me this, but it was a, a, I thought it was an older gentleman who told me. I think he told me to. Anyway, he said he turns your likes into dislikes and your, and your dislikes into likes. You guys ever heard that before? Did he say that? He said that? He said everything once or twice, okay? <laughs> but it does. What happens is the intimacy, the molecules, the welding, you've heard us talk about this, the welding of God in your life, you begin to like the things that he likes and you don't like the things he doesn't like. Things that bother him bothers you. The things that doesn't bother him doesn't bother you. And if those things aren't clicking, be concerned. See, if you're out there, teens, indulging in life that Jesus wouldn't indulge in, that should concern you. It should concern you that it doesn't concern you. That's really important. Because we're not talking about rules, talking about relationship, intimacy, involvement. Jesus has this desire for you to know the Father's heart. God wants you to know him and wants to be known by you. Okay, he wants you to be known by you and he wants to know you with this intimacy. God comes to this guy named Abraham and says, listen, you're going to have a kid. Father of many nations stars this guy. It's going to be great. Years happen. They're, they're hanging around. God's taking his time. You know, that is. They're old. God shows up at their tent one day. Actually, a couple of guys do. Angelic beings, you're really not sure who they are. Abraham comes out, knows they're of the Lord, so they're obviously different. And he says, by the way, we're just here to tell you, Sarah's pregnant. <laughs> She's cracking up. She's cooking in the back. She's like, oh, my word. Because <laughs> she's old. <laughs> you know, she's like, that, that, that ain't happening, you know? Okay? And they had this whole deal. You remember all that. But they're leaving. And then right in the smack dab middle of that passage, God says, shall I hide what I'm going to do from Abraham? Because he's about to go and smash Sodom and Gomorrah. Judge Sodom and Gomorrah because of their sin. And this pricking need within God just says, shall I hide? Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm going to do? And he says, I don't think I will. And he not only doesn't hide it from Abraham, he says, listen, by the way, Sodom and Gomorrah is going down. Don't go east. Okay? But he takes counsel from Abraham. It's like he chooses not to act apart from him. Do you know how beautiful that is? God's not some dictator in the sky ordaining just pointing your future. There's an, he knows you better than you know yourself. He's sucking you and drawing you into this intimacy with him. There's this dialogue, this communication. He loves you. So this need for communication is really strong. We had that before the fall. After the fall, that was just completely gone. So we have a, what's it called? A scarred image, which I don't think is physical. I think it's this, this relationship was totally maintained by God. Billy said it yesterday. He's the one who initiated. He's the one that's coming after us. That's prevenient grace. God did not let us totally slip away. He reached out and held on because he wants to communicate to you. That's really important. Now, there's two aspects of prophecy that I want to talk to you about. Prophecy fulfills two different needs scripturally. You can talk about these in different ways. I found other things that prophecy can talk about. Scripturally, prophecy serves two forms of communication. If you find a different one in Scripture, please let me know. I found two. One is foretelling. Foretelling. The Greek word foretelling is made up of two words. The first dot is going to be pro, and the second is phetes. Pro means before. Phetes means to tell. Prophecy means you tell it before it happens. That's what makes prophecy so cool. No one's impressed about, hey, yesterday, it's going to rain for a bit. <laughs> They're like, dude, that guy's good. He's incredible. <laughs> That's not, there's nothing impressive about that, okay? Prophecy is God comes and says, listen, I've got this desire. I've got this desire in me, and I'm going to tell you where I'm going and what I'm doing. This is going to happen. You can bank on it. And you understand the first prophecy happened in the garden. God comes to Adam and Eve and said, listen, snake, this is your deal. Listen, woman, this is your deal. Listen, man, this is your deal. I'm telling you, you got to know this. It's foretelling. An example of foretelling that I'm going to give you really quickly is Ezekiel chapter 36. And I chose this passage for an uh, uh, important reason. Ezekiel chapter 36, and I didn't put these up on the screen today because they're just so long. Some of them are so long, so we're not going to read all of them. Ezekiel 36, verses 26 and 27. 
he basically gives this prophecy. Excuse me, verses, yeah, 36, verses 26 and 27. God says, I love this. I will give you, and there's more to this, for I'm going to take you out of the nations, in verse 24, I'm going to take you out of the nations, gather you from all the countries, bring you back to your own land. I'll sprinkle clean water on you, will be clean. I'll cleanse you from all your impurities, from all your idols, verse 26. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove you, uh, your heart of stone, and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and cause you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. I'm going to do that. Whether you like it or not, you can bank on it. Foretelling. God tells what he is going to do. This is where I'm going. This is my heart. This is what I'm doing. Now, here's what I thought was also interesting. Coupled with prophecy, not just New Testament, not just the book, but coupled with foretelling is also revelation. God reveals himself in the prophecies. You look at the same passage, 30, uh, example, Ezekiel 36, 8 through 11, God always seems to end these passages with stuff like middle of verse 11. Uh, I'll read verse 11. I will increase the number of men and animals upon you, and they will be fruitful and become numerous. I will settle people on you as the past, uh, as in the past, and will make you prosper them before me. Listen to this. Then you will know that I'm the Lord. It's almost... You, it's crazy how many times that statement's used. In other words, God says, listen, this is what I'm going to do, and you know why I'm doing this? So you're going to know how great I am. So prophecy all the time is coupled, it's not just foretelling. He's speaking about his greatness. He's speaking about where he's going. Why? So you will know not only where he's going, he, he has this desire for partnership, for intimacy. You're not just, he's not, we talked about sheep yesterday, but not sheep in terms of shut your mouth, I'm leading you, just follow. Not that kind of idea. God wants you to be involved. And coupled with the prophecy is a revelation. When you see where he's going, you see how great he is, you learn about his character. So prophecy is not just about foretelling, it's about revelation. Now, when you begin to talk about foretelling, the issue of timelines in prophecy immediately come up. Prophecy is not about pinpointing a date. Prophecy is about revelation of his person. He wants you involved knowing where he's going and what he's doing. Prophecy is not about a date. It is, is not. Now, I put in here as a clause something that I'm pretty strong about. We are to know seasons. You are to know seasons. You say physical seasons? Maybe, sometimes. Spiritual seasons? Yes. I mean, in, Ma in, the, in a couple examples I give that we're not going to walk through for time, examples, Matthew chapters 24 and 25, talk about seasons, spiritual seasons and physical seasons. I mean, he said, listen, when the trees fall off, or when the, the leaves fall off the trees, buy a winter coat. That's what he's saying. It's that, that's the season. He's not saying October 24th, go buy a coat. But he's saying, listen, you're kind of smart. You go outside, you're thinking, wow, man, it's windy. What? Go to Kohl's. The seasons. God talks about seasons all over the place. You are, again, God wants you to know. <laughs> it's like Christmas is coming. He's all keyed up. You guys are going to love this. In fact, let me tell you, Daniel, wrap up some of it. We don't want to release the whole thing, but let me tell you about some of the things I'm going to do. And he just, and just, whoa. A fourth of the Bible. This is where I'm going. This is what I'm going to do. Prophecy. Foretelling revelation. Got to hurry. No dates. Exa example, Matthew 24, 36 through 44. Jesus says, listen, times and dates you're not going to know. Jesus says, I don't. It's set in the Father's plan. The nucleus of creation, um, which is really about uh, prophecy, the specifics. And I'm going to probably paraphrase most of this. Revelation chapter 1 got into the prophecy of Revelation and why I'm talking about all of this to come to Revelation. Chapter 4, the prophecy begins. I'm going to give you this really quickly. The prophecy of Revelation. The primary divisions in Revelation, section 1, is chapter 1. Section 2, 
chapters 2 and 3. Section 3, chapters 4 through 22. And that's the prophecy. That's the foretelling. The big question in our day, is chapters 4 through 22 future to us? Not really sure. We know for sure it was future to them. Or it wouldn't have been prophecy. So from chapter 4 on, had not occurred when it was given. It was foretelling. Chapter 4 is the opening scene. <laughs> I was telling Chad last night that I was so scared to death about getting into the prophecy. You know, just scared to death. But every time I've been scared to death about getting in a passage, you begin to walk into it, God reveals truth. He reveals himself. He reveals where he's going. He reveals what he's doing. And you end up looking at that passage going, that's so, I can't believe I've never seen that before. Duh. Duh. So I'm under the impression every new chapter I go to is I begin to go. Then you get there and you go, well, dude, that's crazy. I don't know, I didn't say it before, you know? Because it's just, you're walking, and I walked into chapter four, opening scene, there's both foretelling and prophecy. Chapter four through chapter 22 is the prophecy itself. Chapter 12 is a good split where you come in just out of the seven uh, seals and the seven trumpets. Seven trumpets explode out of the last seal. And, but chapter 4 is the beginning scene. Chapter 4 and chapter 5 are actually the first of the, beginning, uh, of the whole beginning scene. But chapter 4 is unique, so we're looking at it distinctly. Chapter 4 is a reminder of where God is going and where we came from. Let me say that again. Chapter 4 is where we are going and where we came from. You'd say, what do you mean? Chapter 4 is what creation looked like and was before it was tainted with sin, the rebellion of man, the independence of man. And it's what it's going to look like in the future. It's where God is heading. So at the very beginning, God says, listen, he's coming after, he's redeeming the world. The, 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 just this final incredible push that begins to explode through the book of Revelation. Okay? Begins with, this is where we're going. Chapter 4. Okay? Let me walk you through some of it. God's place in prophecy, verses 3 through 5. God is in the center. Okay? The heart of all of God's communication is that I desire to be in the center of your life. I am the center of things. The center of all things. When you get into the great throne room scene, God is in the center. Okay? Now that's meant... Now, obviously, you can say, is it physical? Well, maybe, but it's, it's probably metaphorical. God is the center of all creation. When God's not the center, everything flies apart. Okay? God is to be the absolute focus and the absolute center. Psalm 19, I'll give you an example of that. The word heart appears 16 times. Matthew, uh, uh, Psalm 119 is really significant. Because it's, almost like this, um, pair, it's almost like this devotional for the Hebrews. And as you go through there, what they're supposed to, to read and what they're supposed to recite and incorporate in their light, God is to be in the heart. It's the center of the body, okay? It's the absolute center of the body. Another illustration I was going to give you is the tree of life in Genesis is in the center. And again, I'm not, maybe it is physical, but what we discovered in Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 is that the tree of life is the style of life of the kingdom, the word tree is the Greek word that is used to reference the cross. It's the cross style. You want to know what the life of God's all about? You want to know what the foundation of the kingdom's going to be? This is it. Jesus lived it. It wasn't just a 33-year kind of kick that he did. It was, the, it, was the, it was the style of the kingdom. That's at the center and the heart of the kingdom. That's the style and life of God himself. It's the center which has to be the center focal point of your existence, his life, his emphasis. Now that's seen in the passage when you get to verses 3 through 5. This is how it reads. And in heaven, and the one sat there, in heaven sitting on the throne, and the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, God's description. The father is described with precious stones, which John, you could say, why is he using stones? <laughs> I got to describe God. God. How, can I, how about rocks? Let's use rocks. You know, you know, the ground. Well, it's difficult. God can't even do it. Moses says, who are you? God says, I don't know. I am who I am. Okay? What do you compare him with? What category do you put God in? God's not a book you can compare to. He's not a human being that you can compare to. 
What's his preaching like? If you heard him, you, there's no category for God. I am who I am. So John's just like, I'll use rocks. <laughs> I'll use rocks. Compressed, shiny, pretty ones. That's what he says. Okay? The one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and Carnelian, a rainbow resembling the emerald encircling the throne. Skip verse 4. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings, and peals of thunder, before the, which is power and glory and majesty. He's picking the best he can come up with to describe this stuff. And of course, I don't have time to embellish the thunderstorm that comes and the power and the, you, feel the, you feel the wind and you feel the, the home. You know, the, you, you, this morning it thundered. This, we, Chad and I were sitting in our, uh, in the house, it thundered and the whole house shook. And I was like, oh. See, John's trying to put that into words. Before the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God, which the Holy Spirit is these seven lamps, the sevenfold spirit of God is this haze that envelops the throne. Okay? Holy Spirit is a haze or fog. Jesus is, is finally brought on the scene in chapter 5, and he's described as the lamb, the lion, and the conqueror. That is our God. And he is standing in the center of the throne. Okay? He is center. Jesus is center of your life. There's going to be a sermon in there. Nail on that one. Jesus is the center. By the way, chapter 4 and 5 is all worship. Guess what makes and defines worship? Music. New. No. No, no, no. What defines worship? People, no. People don't define worship? No. What defines worship? God at the center. When God is at the center, worship is. In other words, when God is at the center of your driving, it's a worship service. So you need to work on that. Mankind's place in prophecy is the next point. Verse 4. Now you would say, hold on, Jeremiah, verse 4, mankind's place in prophecy, it says in verse 4, about 24 elders. Yeah, it does. So how do you say that's representative of mankind? Revelation chapter 21, verses 12 through 14, I'm just going to read this very quickly. The 12 sons of Jacob, I'm going to give you that one, and the 12 disciples of Jesus are mentioned. Um, G, uh, John says very clearly, in verse 22 that he did not see a temple in the city okay there is no temple in the city god almighty is the temple so you have to rethink what we're talking about in terms of when he uses words in the book of revelation like temple chapter 21 verses 12 down through verse 14 he's describing aspects of the city he says it is a great high wall with 12 gates and with 12 angels at the gates and on the gates were written the names of the 12 tribes of israel and he talks about there were three gates there, you know, each side, east, west, north, south. Verse 14, the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the 12 apostles. Numerology is really significant in the book of Revelation. And for some reason, the 12, Israel and Christianity, okay, the engrafted in, okay, the church. Israel and the church are both present in Revelation. I do not believe in a displacement theology that there is no national Israel, that all those prophecies were applied to the church. That's not biblical. You cannot deal with Revelation at all. Might as well cut it out and throw it away, along with other books. In God's plan, Israel, we are grafted in and become one. In Revelation, 12 and 12 make 24. 12 tribes of Israel, 12 apostles representing Jews and Gentiles to the uttermost parts of the earth. And those of us who are in this room, we are the most utter that you can get. Because Israel is on the other side of the world. Okay? So when he says, when he's referring into chapter 4, a very, very accurate biblical guess about the only option you have is that the 24 elders do not represent people, but it represents Jews and Gentiles, the collective sum of all of mankind. And there's descriptions about them and their role in creation. Number one, really quickly, they're seated on thrones which means they have a place of rule. The crown that they wear is not the wreath that's currently, that's consistently used in the New Testament for like finishing a race. It's a golden crown, which means they rule. Which means all the language that's used in chapters two and three of Revelation, that we're going to judge the nations, that we're going to rule. We're going to rule, literally have some kind of authority that God is going to exercise in our relationship that's going to affect angelic beings. We're going to rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over all the earth, and over every creature that moves along the ground. Everything that has the breath of life in it, every tree. 
We were created with that kind of capacity. We are heirs to the throne. Rule. Seated on thrones. That's, that's going to be fun to walk into that. Crowns of gold is a ruling crown. Seated on thrones, crowns. Creation, the last one. Four living creatures. All creation's place of prophecy, verses 4 through 9. Four living creatures. Four numo, is a numerological aspect of Revelation. N-U-M-E-R-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. <laughs> it just say capital N. Um, numeral, N-U-M-E-R-O-L-O-G-I-C-A-L. It's a, a four is really specific in Revelation. Numbers are very specific. Ezekiel echoes, again, Old Testament prophecy, gives content to New Testament prophecy, okay? Especially in Revelation, since it's apocalyptic literature. These four beasts are mentioned in the Old Testament. Nathan's been giving me some good insight into this in terms of the image of God that these represent. And, of course, they do. Uh, wild animals are represented by the lion, ox, domestic animals. Man is mankind. Eagle are the birds of the air. Those are the four animals. And again, their description, they don't really, it doesn't, it doesn't talk about their purpose, although you can call worship, the first dot there, God's purpose for his creation is worship. It's just how they are. God is center of all creation. That's what chapter four is. The whole thing in chapter four is, is God, this is where we're going back to. Mankind, you're going to go back to the way I intended you to be. The earth is going to be restored to the way that I intended it to be. I'm going to be at the center. It's going to be great. That's what he said, chapter 4. We're going to title it great. Just like that. And in terms of worship, and in terms of creation, you're going to say, actually, creation worships, they're going to be singing. Yeah, you have some singing there in Revelation. But he's not talking about singing. He's talking about creation is going to operate in the knowledge of God where God is at the center, even of the animals and the plants, the earth, which is how it was created. I was really intrigued by Isaiah 11, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Last thing I'll say. A shoot will come up from the stump of Jesse. Talking about Jesus. Listen to this. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. The spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The spirit of wisdom and understanding. The spirit of counsel and of power. The spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. He will delight in the fear of the Lord perfect man. That's, how, that, that's, that's who man was be, supposed to be. He will not judge by what he sees with his eyes. Which means Jesus didn't have some kind, he, he, he literally will not live by the flesh in his eyes. Or decide what he hears with his ears. Wasn't smarter than most people. But with righteousness, he will judge the needy. With justice, he will give decisions for the poor of the earth. He will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. With the breath of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Righteousness will be his belt. Faithfulness to sash around his waist. The wolf, talking about the, that's, the, that's our king. Do you know the kind of kingdom he's going to rule? Verse 6, the wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. The calf and the lion and the yearling together and the little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child will put his hand in the viper's nest. Praise the Lord. Where's CJ playing with the vipers? <laughs> He's playing with the vipers again. Okay? That's the world that God intended. Think about this. The first thing that he says in the prophecy, there's this massive birth pains where the new heaven and the new earth is coming and God says this is where I'm going it's it, that's that's foretelling and revelation it's like Christmas morning God says let me tell you what I got you everything before you open it and then tells him he's just, just, just exactly like me I'm I've been saying it for years he just says this is where that's what prophecy is not times and dates there's nothing about times and dates in there there's nothing about billboards it's keyed up expectation. Give yourself to that. Live in expectancy to that. Allow that to be brought forth in your context of life. We've got to quit. Jesus, thank you for the truth of your word. Let it ring in our hearts in your name. Amen.